Bakci, Ambassador of Turkey to Malaysia, Jennifer Bahia, Hansria Abdul Halim, Chairman of UTM Board of Directors, Jan Bahia, Professor Dato Engineer, Dr. Wahid bin Omar, Vice Chancellor, University Technology Malaysia, Your Excellences, Ambassadors, and Diplomats, Senior Officials of the Malaysian Government, NGOs, and Senior University Officials, Fellow Academicians, Members of the Media, Ladies and Gentlemen. I'd like also to take this time to acknowledge the presence of Her Excellency's parents, Professor Dr. Yusuf and Professor Dr. Tulhan. Welcome to this event. And welcome everyone to the first Azman Hashim International Business School Global Dialogue Series 2019. This is a program that features foreign ambassadors and diplomats to speak about high level issues while providing a networking platform and opening opportunities for potential collaborations. This time, we're very honored to have Her Excellency, Dr. Merve Safa Kabakchi, who is acknowledged for her intellectual background and legendary political career. Her Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now begin this event with a recital of du'a. I'd like to call upon Dr. Muhammad Fatih Yusuf to recite the du'a. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us proceed by inviting Yang Babahagia Professor Dato Engineer Dr. Wahid Omar, Vice Chancellor of University Technology Malaysia, to give his welcoming remarks. Please welcome Dr. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning. 
Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wa salatu wassalamu ala ashrafil abdiya'i wa mursalin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Her Excellency Dr. Nova Safa Kabachi Ambassador of Turkey to Malaysia Yang berbahagia Tan Sri Abdul Halim Ali UKM Chairman for the Horat Letters Your Excellency's Ambassadors and Diplomats We have five, six ambassadors today. We have the moment. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, senior officials of the Malaysian government, uh, NGOs and senior university officials, fellow academicians, members of the media. We are indeed very, we are indeed very fortunate to have with us Her Excellency for a global dialogue entitled "A Paradigm Shift in Foreign Policy: Human Humanitarian Approach." So, Excellency and distinguished guests, for your information, AHIPS, a short form, Azman Hashim International Business School. Global Dialogue is a program introduced as a platform for academic discourse and network networking opportunities between diplomats and participants. In the past, the program has successfully featured several ambassadors and diplomats. We had the pleasure of welcoming the Ambassador of Hungary, Ambassador of Gambia, to name a few. And also a Brigadier General, Brigadier, Brigadier General of the United States Army to this Global Dialogue session. AHIP's Global Dialogue has produced ample seats for promising, promising collaborations with foreign partners, which are in line with UTM vision and mission. Her Excellency and distinguished guests, allow me to share a brief background of UTM. UTM history as an education institution spans over more than 100 years. UTM was established as a school in 1904 and became full-fledged university in 1972. And we changed the name to university in 1975. And we reached another important milestone in 2010 when we were awarded research university by the Malaysian government. Today, UTM, UTM has a total undergraduate enrollment of 13,000 and postgraduate of 10,000, of which over 3,000 are, interna are international students. We are energized by over 1,700 <laughs> academic staff and our both JB and campus, KL campus. UTM is currently ranked number 18 for top 50 under 50 is considered as young university by the QS World University Ranking. In July last year, the university went through an important research ring when we when 18 sub-discipline based faculties were consolidated into only seven broad based faculties. So one of the faculties, the Azman Hashim Inter International Business School which is a merger between the accounting and business administration department of the previous faculty of management, now specializes in business and management education that aims to produce leadership and managerial talents with balanced characters who will hopefully contribute to societal well-being. Your Excellency and distinguished guests, UTM has an amicable relationship with the Republic of Turkey we currently have agreements with 14 Turkish universities, which include Bilkan University, Selsu University, Sakarya University, to name a few. We also have take part in the Meblana partnership that provides mobility and scholarship opportunities for student and academic staff between the Turkish and Malaysian higher education institutions. We hope to forge a closer relationship with the Turkish government and the Turkish higher education institutions through various collaborations that are based on mutual interest. Your Excellency, your presence at UTM and the topic today are very timely. The world is facing large-scale humanitarian crises and they are happening ever more pre frequently. It is reported that a colossal 120 million people globally need aid just to survive as a result of violence and conflicts. It is clear that the current measures implemented by international powers are, in, are inadequate to produce sustainable results. 
the magnitude of recent crisis uh, and outcry that forces the world to rethink the way we respond to humanitarian needs. The Turkish government has been very vocal in this agenda, hence we are almost the del utmost delighted to welcome you, uh, Her Excellency, and we feel very honoured that you decided to grace us with your presence today to speak about the Turkish perspective in dealing with in international humanitarian issues. So before I end my speech, I would like to congratulate and applaud Azman Hashim, Azman Hashim International Business School for creating this platform that will potentially translate into meaningful conversations and collaborations. I hope today's engagement diffuses into better relationships between UTM and Turkish higher education, especially, specifically, and between Turkey and Malaysia in general. Thank you very much. Wabillahi taufiq. Wahidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Professor Dato, thank you. We will proceed with the talk by Her Excellency, but before that, please allow me to introduce our distinguished guest. Her Excellency, Dr. Merve Safa Kabachi, who is widely recognized international public figure with a legendary political background. She was elected to the Turkish Parliament, the Grand National Assembly of Turkey in 1999 as first Muslim woman with hijab. Even though she was prevented from serving her team, her political party was closed down by the Constitutional Court and her Turkish citizenship was revoked, banning her from politics for a period of five years. So this Iron Lady never gave up. She took her case to the European Court of Human Rights and won in 2007. So Her Excellency holds a PhD in political science from Ford University in 2007 MPA from Harvard University in 2003, and a BS in Software Engineering from the University of Texas at Dallas in 1993. Prior to serving as the ambassador, she was the founding director of the Post-Colonial Studies Research Center, Pamir at Uskudar University between 2014 to 2017. She was a lecturer of international relations at George Washington University and Howard University in Washington, D.C. between 2004 to 2014. Her Excellency, Dr. Kabachi, has received various awards, among others include the world's most influential 500 Muslims in 2009 by Georgetown University, Appreciation for Social Justice by New York University in 2006, and Women of Excellence by National Association for the Advancement of Colored People from George Washington University in 2004. On top of that, she was awarded the Public Service Award in tribute and in recognition of efforts for the advancement of human rights and Muslim women's empowerment by International Association for Women and Children in 2000. So she also a, was awarded Service to Humanity Award in 1999. Thus, without further ado, I'd like to call upon Her Excellency, Dr. Merve Safa Kabachi, to share her knowledge, views, and experiences on this topic. Her Excellency, the floor is yours. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Assalatu wassalamu ala rasulina Muhammadu wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Asta'inzu billah Wa bishrahli sadri Wa yassirli amri Wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani Yafqahu qawli Distinguished Members Of the administration of UTM, particularly um, distinguished vice chancellor, Tansri Aziz Yasin, my great friends from diplomatic corps, excellencies, representing Ukraine, Qatar, and Egypt, 
who have taken the time from their busy schedules to be with us and to my chagrin, uh, raise the bar pretty high for myself as a speaker on this morning. And a great family of UGM. It's a great pleasure to be here among you this morning. I have to start with a disclaimer. I stand before you here as ambassador of the uh, Turkish Republic for the past uh, year. Um, but in my previous life, I've been an academic and therefore uh, uh, I will, at this very cradle of knowledge, this institution that produces community of knowers, try to balance in between the theoretical that most of you deal here at a university and the practical that we deal on the other side of the aisle as ambassadors, as the actors who maneuver through world politics. So in doing so, I will be jumping back and forth with between the theoretical and the practical now and then. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, please uh, bear with my speed in that sense. And the, I left the most important disclaimer to the end. Uh, I not only come here as an ambassador, I have uh, many hats or, or hat scarves for that matter. <laughs> One of which uh, uh, that runs through my life is to be an activist. And that's always with me. An academic, an activist. And then an ambassador and an activist. And, and when we're an activist, we tend to do a lot, but also talk a lot. So I'll try to rein myself in that. Uh, since we are um, here with our great students and we're looking forward to sending them out as the future leaders of this world. I think it's important to keep that balance. So I'll give a few bits and pieces and hints of some theoretical perspectives as I try to tackle this question of a, a paradigm shift towards a humanitarian international foreign policy approach so that you can go back and look into it further during your spare time and try to, in a way, uh, uh, connect the dots in your mind. Um, when we are talking about a paradigm shift, um, indeed, uh, we're talking not about a done deal. We're actually trying to refer to an enterprise that is a work in progress. A shift does not occur overnight, not in international relations, not in a foreign policy of a country. It does take time for it to occur, so this is a move uh, from whatever it is to a more humanitarian approach. And uh, Turkey will be our case study in this case. And nothing, as you would all know, children uh, and students of political science and world politics, we know that nothing happens in a vacuum, right? And therefore, we have to put a 
contextualization to whatever we're talking about. In this context, uh, the paradigm shift that we're talking about does cover a certain time period. Um, and in there, we want to position this country called Turkey somewhere in a time interval. Uh, and therefore, we can't just talk about today and now and here. We must look back a little bit and create a contextualization of what we understand from this foreign policy shift. So I would say that the context within which we do operate is the post-Cold War period indeed. And there are several sort of uh, uh, international at times overlapping discourses that we uh, we maneuvered our lives through as countries. Um, one of them was the very sort of infamous or famous for that matter, clash of civilization argument brought to us by Samuel Huntington, right? Uh, someone that uh, 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 we share the uh, sort of the university environment together before he passed away, of course, during his time at Harvard University. And interestingly, uh, Samuel Huntington uh, in his classes was uh, uh, also, uh, as a case study, uh, talking about the uh, Turkish member of parliament's ousting as the first Mohajiba women in the parliament in his class discussions of those years in early 2000s. And uh, with that also we have, um, uh, in addition to Huntington's argument, we have the end of the history theoretical perspective. You guys can jot these down uh, as a note so that in, uh, later you can go up and revisit the ideas. Uh, basically, promoted to us by um, another you know, colleague from right across the uh, block uh, from George Washington University where I was teaching uh, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Fukuyama talked about the theory of coming to the end of the history. Humanity has reached to the end of its history, its development and its democratization has reached to a level of saturation that we're actually leading towards the end of the history. And then, of course, in this post-Cold War period, we had the September 11 attacks, the new millennial generation was born, most of you guys, and we moved into this technological advancement and industry zero. 4.0s and other things, and now uh, at the end of two decades after that, Turkey, Turkish Republic, is trying to make that move from a very realist perspective of international politics into a more humanitarian approach. So this is where we are. To understand this very particular uh, country that is at the middle of the East and the West, a literally bridge builder between Europe and Asia, between Islam, the Middle East, and Europe, more symbolized by values of Christianity. Between the past, that is the Roman, Byzantine, and the Ottoman, and the future, the European Union, United States of America, and, and whatnot. Within that international context, 
Turkey has been a country that tried to vacillate in between and somehow find a way to develop itself through what we call modernization projects. And here, again, students can look up uh, on references of theories of modernization. I think uh, Smith and Inglis is a good reference on that, uh, creation of modern man, uh, in the way that uh, European countries have developed themselves into industrialized nation states. Other countries are asked to follow suit in a way to suggest that there is only one fits all kind of development, modernization, and modernity. That theoretical perspective was very much embraced by the Republic of Turkey. And in there, of course, there is a in the, within the specific realm of Turkey, a Europeanization and Westernization project. So modernization is an overarching goal that you see runs through one demo, uh, uh, geographic demarcation to another, but Westernization is the name of that modernization theory within Turkey, and what you do is you put a twist, a, a, a twist, a, a, maybe a Foucauldian twist from, let's borrow this term from uh, uh, French philosopher Michel Foucault and put it there, a Foucauldian twist that combines power with systems of representation. Power is symbolized within the form and format of modernity, modernization within the context of Turkey that meant westernization and Europeanization. Okay, for a cursory reader, this might be a bit complicated. So let me put it in more simplistic terms. Whatever is good comes from Europe. Whatever is produced by the Western European countries is to be taken without any questioning and have an upper hand on what is the indigenous and the local. What this does is it creates an environment where there is no clear outlet for any alternatives. An alternative way of developing yourself, an alternative outlet for voicing your opinion that may not always overlap with what you say that might sound very European. So we have come a long way from there. Turkey has um, basically internalized this uh, uh, system for a very quite a long time. And this actually gave an impetus, a catapult uh, to Turkey to have a special status within the eyes of the developed uh, Western world. Uh, that in a way, to be able to replicate, that effort to try to replicate what is Western and European, allowed the international community at some times to cut a slack at Turkey, that is to say, to look away from some of the problematic uh, points that they would want, actually, other Muslim countries to see developed and take care, they said, oh, Turkey, Turkish Republic is just like us, trying to be like us, a member of the European Union, trying to come into accession to European Union, and therefore, we can give the special status 
to Turkey. After all, Turkish Republic is a one Muslim member of NATO. So Northern Atlantic Treaty Organization comprised of uh, 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 countries um, the, other than uh, uh, Turkey uh, that are not Muslim. So it is the only Muslim member uh, country of NATO. And more importantly, Turkey is a secular country. Uh, that secularization is, is very, very critical for from the Turkish perspective. And you might say, uh, what, what is Professor Ambassador talking about? Give, to give in a, a, in a nutshell, the Turkish secularism, in some ways, in some other parts of the world, it might be considered as a separation of church and state, separation between uh, religion and uh, the state. Turkish secularism is a very fundamental value of the very making of the Turkish Republic. Okay? And in there, for quite uh, a long time, we have construed uh, secularism as a means of secular fundamentalism. Uh, when we talk about extremism and fundamentalism, uh, generally the discourse includes the kind of uh, 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 discussions of religious extremism, right? And Islamic extremism and fundamentalism. But uh, in the case of uh, some countries, you can also turn secularization uh, almost to a tabooish construction where uh, religion becomes part and parcel of the uh, uh, secular identity. That is to say, secularism in of itself becomes a religion. Uh, so Turkey stands as this uh, example, great example of the uh, uh, secular uh, tradition as well. Uh, one more thing that uh, made Turkey what it is and what it was, um, in the past uh, was its uh, relationship with the military establishment. Uh, military, Turkish military has been always very meddlesome, very prying into, very present in uh, Turkish life. Uh, uh, that is the political life and therefore we uh, uh, grew up with the tradition of military interventions and coup d'etat to the extent that these are carried out periodically. Every 20 years there is a military intervention and, and this comes actually uh, with a very plausible tradition of reverence to the military from the get-go and actually from earlier uh, uh, times of uh, the Ottoman period. Military is perceived as part of the secrecy uh, and uh, it's a part and parcel of the uh, sort of administrative uh, 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 enterprise and therefore um, as you do revere to your sacred values you also uh, revere and pay respect uh, to your military. That was the case within the Ottoman Empire. It has continued after the re Republican establishment in 1920s as well. But interestingly, in modern day, for a country that is trying to democratize itself, not to be able to uh, rain the military's cloud on political affairs creates created problems for Turkish political realm. Um, and therefore, 
The emergence of the civil society has lagged behind a little bit. Um, and um, uh, we have endured uh, uh, many ample military uh, interventions um, as late as uh, 2016, one could say. Um, now, for us, this paradigm shift from uh, what you would call from realism, a very austere face of realist uh, perspective towards more humanitarian and maybe uh, a more idealist, has uh, become uh, more apparent and it jumped out at us uh, starting with the period of this new uh, millennium uh, after 2002. Uh, basically, what we are looking at there is the students of political science. When we talk about realism, we are indeed making a reference to Machiavelli. We're making a reference to, say, Margotha, right? And what we're saying is, in a nutshell, you gotta do what you gotta do in realist perspective. To help others, no. To develop your nation, oh, not necessarily. To serve your national interest, oh no, not necessarily that. But to maximize your power. Indeed, that is superquoted in a way that that is to our national interest to do this and to do that, and it is to our national interest to go and invade blah blah country for a country X and Y. Um, but at the end of the day, what we see in Machiavelli's policies is maximization of power. <coughs> without any strings attached. That's why I like the term in a way, you do what you gotta do to maximize your power. That's exactly what it is. How you will go to legitimize that, that's very secondary. What you can do is basically find a way to put it in a politically correct way. You can do that later. But your ultimate goal is to maximize your power. And of course, as a middle scale country that has long been a, somewhat of a satellite, you know, uh, and a developing country, uh, Turkey has been uh, uh, trying to maneuver itself within this very harsh politics of real politic, realist perspective. So it is not an easy process to try to make a shift uh, from that to a more humanitarian approach. I think what we have done um, a good job in, now looking back uh, 20 years uh, of that process, and it's an ongoing process, so most of my statements here Please do not bring them back to me with a sort of uh, 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 straight uh, 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 demarcated uh, convictions because here we are trying to offer some generalizations. Although as an academic, I'm supposed to stay away from generalizations, but for the purpose of this lecture, in this very limited time, to make a point, you have to always seek refuge in making generalizations, right? So it's an ongoing process. When we're talking about that shift, it is really a shift process that we are trying to refer to. I think one thing we have done a good job uh, uh, that I can point to is uh, the success we had in the process of democratization of the minds. And I, I, I tried, I, I love this term, uh, I concocted the term, 
and that was some, some years ago during a lecture at Yale University, and I, I, I was talking to this group of Yale uh, law school students, and, uh, uh, and, and, and the best way to sort of suggest them that what Turkey needed to do by then, and that was uh, right after my ousting from the parliament, um, uh, I suggested that Turkey must democratize the minds of its people. Uh, that is to say, um, you can have this great institution, a great LCD projector, the great uh, hallway and the amphitheaters and the campus and the great city and a great political machinery for that matter, right? You have your political machinery in, mostly in Putrajaya, right? Uh, you can have your capitals and all of these great institutions with uh, fantastically looking um, um, uh, architecture, uh, buildings, and uh, greatly informed citizens and public servants might be there, but if you do not teach your people or give the hints to your people to find their way through democratic process, it doesn't do any good. You need to teach somehow to your people, give them the skills, hone their skills in being a democratic citizen, an empowered citizen. From democratic, I, I mean an emancipated, empowered citizen with all citizenship rights, but not only with the rights, with the cognizance of that they hold all of those citizenship rights. That, I think, we have done quite a bit uh, uh, of strides in the past decade and a half. Well, uh, it's a work in progress. It's a learning process. At the end, uh, overall, when we look today, despite all of its challenges, we have an economically, here and there, with its exceptions, a stable Turkish Republic. Economically, we are the 13th largest in the world. With incessant, unremitting intervention attempts from outside, from within, within and without, outside and inside, has merged together in this world of ours that we say the global village, right? I mean, we no longer live uh, through these um, uh, uh, greatly departing and separated countries. What happens here has an effect on people thousands of miles away. What happens there affects us here. And therefore, the world maybe is as large as before, but has become much smaller as well. And therefore, I'm from the uh, uh, camp who believes that, well, basically, we're losing that uh, demarcations of countries and people are uniting together, then they are going apart based on their temporary uh, uh, interests. They convene and adjourn at different facets. So we see many cases of multilateralism today and moving from away from this bipolar world of the Cold War to multifaceted, multilateral, multipolar world of today. And there, 
somehow through prudent fiscal policies, of course, that included structural reforms and whatnot, we managed to become 13th largest world economy. Uh, with a great uh, uh, average uh, growth of approximately, again, uh, uh, with a margin of error, 6.4%. Uh, of course, direct foreign, def uh, foreign direct investment has played an important role. Uh, and I must here say uh, that uh, Malaysia has not done very bad either. When in 2002, uh, our uh, president, uh, President Erdogan's party, has come to power in Turkey, <coughs> An interesting discourse has developed in the uh, intelligentsia of the Turkish Republic. The question uh, that this discourse uh, was uh, in, uh, uh, put forth involved Malaysia. Uh, the question read, is Turkey becoming Malaysia? Is Turkey going to become Malaysia? Uh, that was an interesting question uh, that was put out there, and people have discussed this. And of course, why Malaysia? Uh, uh, it was Malaysia because uh, Malaysia was uh, perceived as this uh, great country that has done quite a bit in economic development under your um, uh, uh, prime minister, Tun Mahathir's first term. And I remember the first uh, time when uh, our, then our leadership and uh, uh, his leadership got together to establish D8, developing eight countries as an alternative to what was then called G7 in early 1990s. Uh, I was a uh, uh, a young uh, uh, engineer uh, with my degree in my hand, but no place to accept me uh, with my headscarf on my head, and therefore uh, found my niche in political rank to volunteer for this Islamic party of a uh, welfare party at the time. And uh, Tun and our uh, uh, prime minister then um, uh, uh, our leader of our party, Arbakan, they got together and established this uh, D8 uh, uh, sort of rise up of the uh, uh, Muslim Ummah at the time. And uh, following through that, indeed, Turkey, Malaysia had uh, 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 taken its share in economic development, right? And therefore, when in 2002, this Islamically oriented Muslim politicians came to power, there was this sort of a jittery a feeling within the secular fundamentalist circles of Turkey, oh, we are going to become like Malaysia. From their perspective, that was something to be frowned upon. But I, when I landed here uh, and uh, uh, going here and there, I've always kept that question at the back of my mind now that we've uh, uh, gone into almost 20 years after that discussion has uh, started. And is Turkey really in some ways like Malaysia? Or uh, does Turkey have to be like Malaysia? or? Uh, Maybe Malaysia is becoming like Turkey and vice versa. So these are some of the intellectual questions one could keep in mind uh, from the Turkish perspective because we had come up with this uh, 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 discourse early on. And honestly, uh, one can say that uh, in looking at the relationship between Turkish Republic and Malaysia, um, uh, Malaysian uh, uh, economic sort of export line had done a somewhat of a great 
job, not a very good job, but within its own realm, a great job, a greater job than the Turkish side. So we have a $3 billion economic flow from Malaysia to Turkey. Unfortunately, in return, it's only 300 million. So there's a discrepancy there that we need to close down. There are only eight companies of Turkish Republic in this country. But there are 48 Malaysian companies in Turkey. You have your aluminum and of course your palm oil, right? Well, we have our chemicals and iron and steel, and we have our olive oil, right? <laughs> you must taste that. You have your electronics, we have our textile. Indeed, you have your rubber and plastic. We have our defense industry. Now, uh, as far as defense industry is concerned, this is an area that we very much take pride in. Uh, Turkey has made so much strides despite all of the preclusions and the challenges that it had on its way uh, from, uh, 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 of course, conglomerates and tycoons and the sort of monopolies of the defense industry around the world, we are today have reached a point to establish almost 70% nationally made defense products, all Turkish made, and the fifth generation generation aircrafts and uh, uh, defense products, as they call them, produced by United States, Russia, and China. Now, Turkey joins into that group. As you can imagine, to be able to raise your, not just your economic welfare, but your technological community of knowers to a level to, to produce for your own uh, is a challenge in of itself. And we're able to do that. Uh, healthcare system is an area that we take very much pride in. And then again, um, uh, we're looking forward to joining hands with Malaysian authorities. Uh, the work is already progressing uh, with respect to the uh, healthcare reform that we have achieved over the decade and a half. And Malaysian counterparts uh, uh, have been very uh, instrumental in approaching to our side to, in a way, replicate some of the systems that we have. Uh, Turkey today ranks number one preferred destination for Europeans in healthcare. It ranks number three around the world in healthcare destination. We've, of course, indeed, that's not an easy uh, process to come to this point. And uh, we've spent $50 billion, we've invested in that in a decade and a half to pick up the pieces of the Turkish Republic's healthcare system. And I have to say, it was not, uh, it was not good when we first started. But we managed that. So the universal healthcare is not just open to the Turkish citizens, but we offer that to war-torn uh, areas of the world, irrespective of uh, ethnic, 
religious or geographic demarcations. And, and the, the uh, uh, static sticks uh, uh, are very uh, striking in that sense. Uh, why I uh, talk about this sort of background information is to bring uh, the discussion to a point of where we are as far as humanitarian approach is concerned, right? That's what garners quite a bit of attention here in this part of the world. And how come is that? Uh, Turkey has turned into, from its realist perspective of foreign policy to this more idealist and humanitarian approach, not only able to take care of its own people's needs, but also uh, does not vacillate, has no trepidation for a moment to extend a helping hand to others. Global Human Assistance Report recently has announced that Turkish Republic is the largest donor in the world of humanitarian <laughs> help. Oh. 
host them as your guests alone and to treat them as your muhajirin and take on the role of the Ansar and provide them almost all of the citizenship rights like education and healthcare and safety and whatnot, like the rest of your people, but also, also, to make sure that these guests who are looking forward to going back to their lands, to their homes, they have a safe place to go. They have a home they can go back to. That responsibility is on the honors of the Turkish Republic as well. That is why the Republic has uh, carried out uh, the, uh, uh, the um, operations to clean out the terrorist factions from the lands of our Syrian guests so they could go back. And actually, they did go back. And they are going back. So far, I think the number is around uh, 310,000 and counting. That is the humanitarian approach to be able to aid and assist in a way that creates sustainability. Unlike what the dependency theory promotes. Again, another food for thought for our students of IR, look up and jot down the theory of dependency, which creates more and more dependent masses with the pretext of aiding and assisting, giving with one hand, but taking out with the other hand in bunches, right? You don't want that. Today, the Turkish Republic is not in any way connected to IMF, International Monetary Fund. But we were not a country as such in the past. We were connected. Why? When you are within that vicious circle of dependency, yes, you get some aid and assistance, but you're indebted more and more, and that creates a sustainable dependency in of itself. With the leadership of President Erdogan, we paid it off, we cut out our relationship, and we moved on. That is what the developing world has to do. And in there, um, I think I can uh, leave you uh, with uh, a few uh, suggestions and uh, examples from the Turkish Republic. Uh, one thing that our leadership very much points out is to recognize the problem, first of all. You have to contextualize your problem in the in the best, healthiest possible way, uh, you must, we must all understand that this world, in this world, on this planet, each one of us matters. A life in KL is as valuable as a life in Madrid, or London, or New York, or in Turkey. And therefore, 
in international realm, it's important that we recognize that this world is greater than five. That's what our president says. This world is greater than five. What he means by that is that he makes a reference to UN, the United Nations Security Council, which has five permanent countries that decide on the destiny of the whole world. <coughs> Any and everybody that lives on this planet, at times the members of these five countries, administrations of these five leading countries, decide on our behalf. And we say that actually the world is much greater than five. And all lives matter. And the problems of the Muslim world, or the Middle East, or the Southeast, or the Christian world, or this world, or that world, or this ethnicity, or that ethnicity, doesn't matter. All problems are worth paying attention to, working on, and putting heads together to work to solve them. I leave you with that, and thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Samiti. Samiti, could you please remain on stage to accept a small token from us as our humble appreciation for your time and thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Professor Dr. Nurnaha Abu Manso to accompany young Barbahagia, Professor Dr. Engineer, Dr. Wahid Omar, UDM Vice Chancellor for Exchange of Civilian. Ladies and gentlemen, we sincerely honor the time and commitment spent by Her Excellency Dr. Mervé Safa Kabakshi with us today, although brief but significantly meaningful in so many ways. Thank you, Her Excellency. Thank you, Dr. Visi, and thank you, Prof. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Alhamdulillah, we have come to the end of our event. Let us swiftly gather to the center of the hall to, uh, for a